A cattle battle brewing in the mid-state. What's the creek like now? There's no crawfish, there's no tadpoles, there's no fish. The operation, some say, is putting the community in danger because of manure. A deadly profession made even more dangerous when companies cut corners. What do you think was the main reason why it took so long? It's absolutely frustrating. What put the brakes on Metro's plan to protect construction workers? Fox 17 News at 9 starts now. Middle Tennessee's only prime time news. This is Fox 17 News at 9, your code red station. Fox 17 News at 9. We start tonight with a code red weather alert as strong storms are once again making its way through the mid state. In less than 24 hours, we could see high winds, heavy rain, and even hail. Fox 17 Chief Meteorologist Katie Morgan here with the timing. And um, I said this earlier, we've seen this movie before, not again. I know. <laughs> we just, know how it is. You were setting yeah. it up, and I, I almost had deja vu, it seems uh, like. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Unfortunately, yeah, we're going to be not only looking at tomorrow, but several days uh, for the threat of strong thunderstorms, I'm afraid to say. We will start with the focus on tomorrow, and tomorrow is one of the better days as of right now, but it really is looking like each and every day we've got at least a small chance for a couple strong storms. Tomorrow, I expect the timing mainly to be between 4 and 9 p.m. for Wednesday. Highest threat along and west to 65. Wind and hail the primary threats. The tornado threat is not real high. It's not zero, but it's not really high. Uh, and localized flooding could become a concern too with these rounds of storms that we are expecting here. Now, the latest storm prediction center does put us in a level one out of five threat for us in Nashville. We're kind of clipped by that level two threat. So again, that higher threat will be for those uh, west of 65. Things are pretty quiet this evening here. Radar picture staying that way as well. Tomorrow morning we may be waking up to some showers, a few rumbles uh, with this decaying line here, but I uh, do not expect it to be a, a big problem for us uh, as far as severe weather goes. Our severe weather threat will be in the afternoon. This line though producing severe weather. In, in fact, intense tornadoes out west. This is video from uh, Iowa and uh, again, the uh, images that we're seeing this evening here coming in uh, from uh, social media and from our, our uh, media partners here are just incredible. That's a wind turbine that actually a tornado the tornado toppled. Uh, so again, uh, my heart goes out to everyone impacted by severe weather tonight. It has uh, really been a, a scary evening on radar. And again, some of the images that are coming out, some towns directly hit, unfortunately, in Iowa. We'll talk more about our severe weather risk for tomorrow and the chances moving forward. That's all coming up in your Fox 17 Code Red forecast. Man, that was Time is the most precious thing in this life. And it's a shame that it's had to be stripped from some of these workers and some of these families. Well, new tonight, two more lives lost while Nashville city leaders fight to enhance protections for construction workers. Fox 17 News' Caitlin Miller now live downtown at the Metro Courthouse after talking with some council members tonight about a proposed ordinance drafted after state lawmakers killed an earlier safety measure. Yes, well, Metro Council member Sepulveda says that today was bittersweet. She says it's a big step in the right direction from workers' rights, but also a time to remember the workers that we lost along the way. When he got the news, he wasn't even in Tennessee. He was out in Pennsylvania working in a warehouse. Alonzo Alvarez lost his 20-year-old cousin, Dennis Giovanni Bache. He died while working on the roof at Glencliff High School in Antioch. Alvarez was joined by an interpreter. He hopes that... His cousin's death will not be in vain, that this will be the last one. This happened last October, and in 2020, a 16-year-old named Gustavo Ramirez died working a summer job at a Nashville construction site. He sees how dangerous it is to work out here and how many injuries occur here and that companies should really be uh, responsible for their workers, for their injuries. Metro Council member Sandra Sepulveda is leading the charge for change with a new proposed city ordinance, Build It Right Bill, that will create a uniform system to audit contracts across all departments, uphold workers' rights, and ensure compliance with equal business opportunity programs. Sepulveda says the fight to protect these workers has taken years because she explains previous legislation was overruled by the state. What do you think was the main reason why it took so long? Was it the state and is it frustrating that it took so many years to get here? No, it, it's absolutely frustrating. 
in the while we were working on this a person died right so every every day every week every year that goes by more people are getting hurt more people are dying sepulveda emphasizes enough is enough people should be able to return home the way that they leave home and can live a better life Sepulveda emphasizes the urgency of this ordinance. She says that this proposed board would have the authority to evaluate contracts. Reporting live from downtown, I'm Caitlin Miller, Fox 17 News, your Code Red Station. Caitlin, thank you. Data shows there were more construction industry deaths here in Nashville in 2022 than any other city in the state of Tennessee. 43 people working in the construction industry died on the job statewide. That's more than twice as many as the previous year, which was 21. The two top causes, falls and transportation incidents. I have felt uneasy for quite a few years. Tonight in Operation Crime and Justice, a woman accused of stabbing a WeGo bus driver is shining a light on the bigger issue. As Fox 17 News' Kylie Walker explains, community advocates say changes are needed right now to keep drivers and riders safe. This morning, I spent my time looking into past altercations that happened either on a WeGo bus or at a WeGo facility. And although I found incidents dating back several years, Two of those happened this past week alone. 30 year old Derica Skivoli is now charged with attempted murder. This after Metro Police say she stabbed and threatened to kill a WeGo bus driver who asked her to sit down and be quiet. And just last week, a convicted felon was arrested after police say a teenager was shot on the steps of a WeGo building downtown. Many of the customers that use the services uh, have disabilities, they have many different backgrounds, and this is a need for them. So we need our transit services to be safe and reliable, but unfortunately over the last few years, that's not what's been happening. Darius Knight, a Nashville native, has been using public transportation for years, but it wasn't until 2016 that he started speaking out at MTA board meetings. I have seen many different things, many operators be assaulted physically, verbally, spat on. Um, I have felt uneasy for quite a few years, and that was one of the reasons that pushed me to advocate, not only for the customer, but for my family who works at this agency. Knight says he feels his concerns have not been taken seriously for years now. I'm even struggling to get the CEO secretary to even respond. If I want to send something to a board member, they don't even contact me back. I have recorded multiple times of me leaving voicemails and no response. We also tried speaking with MTA board members ourselves, but we were told they would not be available for comment. However, a WeGo representative says they're now working with a security consultant firm. The two will look at a variety of safety measures, including their current security staffing models, as well as recommendations for placement of emergency messaging systems and panic alarms. Now today I requested the criminal incidences from buses and facilities from last year into this year's April. And WeGo says I should get those reports in the coming days. For now, reporting in Nashville, Kylie Walker, Fox 17 News, your Code Red Station. Continuing Operation Crime and Justice, police in Clarksville are investigating the murder of a decorated Fort Campbell soldier. Clarksville police say that Katia Aguilar was found dead inside a home on Tiny Town Road, not far from the post on Saturday night. The 23 year old was from Texas. A spokesperson for the 101st Airborne says that the unit is fully cooperating with the investigation. Continuing coverage now on the death of a Rutherford County boy who was swept into a storm drain during the severe weather we had a couple of weeks back. Asher Sullivan's family says that they donated their son's organs and were able to save four lives in doing so. The 10 year old died over the weekend after suffering brain damage from the incident. New information tonight on the future of Elvis's former home Graceland. A company claims the property is heading for foreclosure, but county records are shedding doubt on that claim. The Register of Deeds says that there is no record of a deal between Graceland and Nusini Investments. The company says Lisa Marie Presley put up the property to secure a loan. Elvis's granddaughter is now fighting that claim. 
A Fox 17 News health alert tonight celebrating a new state law to better protect young athletes across the volunteer state. This measure essentially mandates automated defibrillators to be on hand at all practices, games and classrooms in our public schools. NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell joining Governor Bill Lee in celebrating this law. After the break, a cattle battle along the Tennessee Kentucky line. The runoff concerns connected to a one of a kind cattle company. And checking out the Titans' new offensive weapons, the excitement about the team's wide receivers. The Metro Council voted on The controversy continues tonight over what could become the largest cattle operation in our state. We found a farmer in Clay County, a cattle farm that was feeding some 8,000 cattle at one time without a permit. Well, the state now suing the Browning Cattle Company over polluted waterways as the owner works to get licensed. But as Fox 17 News Kelly Avelina shows us, some neighbors say their community is being trampled. They know the sound. Hey girl. It's a supper time routine. Trey Anderson and his family repeat daily since 1870. And they're very cognizant of you. This cow here, I can walk back here rubber. A mile up the road. As many as 8,000 cattle were being fed and shipped out west for about two years at the Browning Cattle Company without a permit. What's the creek like now? There's no crawfish, there's no tadpoles, there's no fish. The past couple years smelled and looked like an open sewer. TDEC issuing owner 23 year old Trace Browning five violations for issues like not having a permit and pollution found on the site with runoff impacting streams. Describe what you see left behind after a rain event. Same shit every day. <laughs> Next door to Browning, Mary Deckard says 16 of her calves have died. The necropsy showing E. coli and shipping fever. Um, we've not had these problems for the 26 plus years until he moved in. DDEC posting no swimming signs along Trace Creek in the county, finding dangerously high levels of E. coli. Just over a week after our visit, a park bordering the creek in TDEC's targeted section gets a $285,000 playground with state grant money and donations. The state attorney general's office slapping the Browning Cattle Company with a lawsuit last December, citing illegal discharges, illegal CAFO operations, and illegal land clearing. Right now, Brown Browning has scaled back to less than a thousand cattle after a court injunction until he gets his permit. But I can tell you his application is asking for about 9,000 head of cattle on his property. TDEC's most recent water samples from this past January show lower E. coli levels than last summer. But TDEC says still significantly above acceptable water quality standards established by the Tennessee Water Quality Control Act. Under the regulations, sample Browning Agricultural Attorney Dave Moore disputes the pollution, particularly the impact of E. coli, whether it came from the Browning farm and how TDEC collected the samples. He says Browning has spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to install some of the most stringent barriers in the southeast, like miles of fencing and buffers. The largest 48 acres of protective buffers in the state of Tennessee. Moore tells me that Browning is now stopping all cattle feeding operations until TDEC approves the permit. Browning has done everything that any government entity has asked for. And additionally, we have a consulting team that has some of the, the best and most advanced environmental consultants in the nation on these items. But TDEC has repeatedly sent the application back for revisions for months. One state environmental specialist questioning in a May 3rd email if there's adequate storage on site to hold the amount of solid manure and liquid effluent. If, if TDEC would approve our plan and allow us to put those basins in, then, uh, you know, that's the fix. But this is Tennessee and this is hill country and the topography here does not allow for that type of operation. About two dozen supporters and family members of Browning met us when we interviewed those opposed to the operation. They say his farm provides a substantial boost for their local economy. Well, that puts the bread on the table of our local workers. 
I asked state officials if a permit can be denied based on community outcry or that Browning had operated without a permit. A TDEC representative replying, permitting decisions are based on whether an application complies with applicable technical requirements. Our farm lifestyle and our way of life is under siege here with this cattle operation and has been for two years. Before any permits are granted, there has to be a public hearing, and I can tell you many of the residents we heard from today will be making their voices heard there. I can also tell you that some of the neighbors who are opposed to this cattle operation tell me they are considering taking their own legal action. In Clay County, I'm Kelly Avellino for Fox 17 News, your Code Red station. In our Code Red alert, again, this is a damage out of Iowa here. Uh, looks like Adams County. Uh, again, these are all images from this afternoon where devastating uh, tornadoes have moved through some very violent tornadoes um, and some of the most incredible images I've ever seen. So uh, again, uh, heart going out to a lot of folks there in Iowa, especially, and it continues. In fact, this evening, uh, the line now most severe in Wisconsin. So it's pushed into the Great Lakes and you can see sort of a trailing line of showers and storms moving through Arkansas and into uh, Missouri. This line broken line will actually reach us by tomorrow morning. Now I don't expect severe weather for tomorrow morning. We do have a small threat for severe storms in the afternoon and the evening though, and this is what our outlook looks like for tomorrow. So level one threat here in Nashville. Most of these storms will be at their strongest in our western counties and then will decay or weaken once they move into uh, Nashville. We've got a couple rounds of thunderstorms here on the way, multiple rounds in fact. And each day we'll at least see a small chance for severe storms. So uh, medium threat tomorrow, mainly again west to 65. Low threat for Thursday, Friday and Saturday. And then Sunday into Monday, we'll have another chance for strong to severe thunderstorms. Already looking at some signals that uh, indicate the potential for severe storms. Uh, so giving that a medium chance right now. Temperatures for tomorrow will be in the 80s. We will see showers in the morning, as I mentioned. And then again in the evening, the afternoon round will be what we're looking for severe weather. So here's that first line here that'll be marching in for tomorrow morning. Rumbles of thunder, some heavy pockets of rain around. Uh, we'll likely see a break late morning into the first part of the afternoon. But notice as we head later in the day here, you can see this line starting to develop. This will bring us a chance for showers and storms. Again, a few gusts of wind as high as 60 miles per hour for folks, mainly in Clarksville, Hopkinsville, Dixon, Linden maybe, and possibly looking at a couple strong storms as far uh, east as Nashville and Murfreesboro. But as that line continues to push through here into the evening hours, we're going to start to lose some of the energy and that will uh, keep the showers and rumbles of thunder going, but the severe weather threat will be coming to an end. The good news is overnight into early Thursday, we're looking at to mainly uh, dry conditions for the overnight time period, but by about 4 or 5 a.m. we're looking at another round of showers moving in for Thursday. These again looking non severe for Thursday morning, but we get into the afternoon and the potential for more showers and storms where a few could be on the strong side will be possible. We'll take a look at that threat and we'll have a look at our threat going into the holiday weekend that coming up in your Fox 17 code red forecast. Also ahead, back on the playing field, our first look at the Titans' newest weapons on offense. Today marked day two of the Titans' voluntary organized team activities, and for the first time this offseason, we got to see the team's new wide receiver court in action. Hoping it's going to be more potent, Fox 17 Sports Director Jill Jelnick now with more on the new faces in the wide receiver room. Titans head coach Brian Callahan making a flurry of moves this offseason to help improve the roster, and one of those areas was the Titans wide receiver room. Titans signing both Tyler Boyd and Kelvin Ridley this offseason, adding two more veterans on top of the presence of DeAndre Hopkins. Now, Hopkins, Boyd, and also Ridley were all at OTAs this week, giving quarterback Will Levis plenty of options to throw to, which coach Callahan says is a really great problem to have. It should afford a lot of opportunities, um, a lot of Less, a lot less double coverage, a lot less cloud. Um, all, all these guys all want the ball, and it's a great problem to have. Man, I mean, I can learn from them guys, and, and they can learn from me. You know, and just having that trio of us, you know, is going to just make this whole offense even more deadly. He's one of the best wide receiver groups I've had a chance to play with on paper. So, uh, obviously, you know, I can come up here and say a bunch, but we haven't played a game yet. So, uh, 
you know, we'll see how, how it goes once we uh, once we hit the field. Boyd is already familiar with the Titans offense because of his time with Coach Callahan when he was the OC for the Bengals. Boyd says that it's certainly an advantage when it comes to learning the playbook, and it also will be an advantage when he quickly builds chemistry with quarterback Will Levis. I think it, it allows him to play more freely and more comfortable because he know that I know the offense. He know that I will be uh, in positions of the field where he expect me to be. It's been a quick turnaround this week for Tyler Boyd. He first flew into Nashville on Monday and then quickly got right to work on the practice field with the rest of the team on Tuesday. It's the first time in his eight year NFL career that he's wearing a jersey other than the Cincinnati Bengals. He says being a veteran that transition is a little more smoother and it also helps that he's played for head coach Brian Callahan before. Reporting from the Titans practice facility, Jill Jonlick, Fox 17 Sports, your Code Red Station. The Preds with a shocking move at the start of the offseason, trading away defenseman Ryan McDonough today to the Tampa Bay Lightning in exchange for him and a fourth round pick. The Preds will receive a second round pick in 2025 and a seventh round pick in 24. General Manager Barry Trotz said that McDonough had uh, asked to try to get back to Tampa, his choice, and Trotz followed through on that request. Just ahead, helping those in need one foot at a time. The difference a new pair of shoes can make for a child. And the soundtrack of the summer. <laughs> How much longer the cicadas will be sticking around. Sure. In your community tonight, a partnership paying dividends for children whose families locally are experiencing homelessness. The numbers in Nashville alone are staggering, but tonight, thanks to Metro Schools and Souls for Souls, another group of homeless children now has shoes for the summer. Oh, you can fit that, Jamal. That's nice. Doris Monger and her daughters shopping for essentials. It's not a department store, but it kind of looks like one. This store is part of Metro School's Homeless Education Resource Office, providing clothing, shoes, and more to families who need a helping hand. Perfect. We have gotten clothes, hygiene products. We've also gotten toys, books for the children shoes, food. It doesn't solve the housing issue, but it helps families know and helps students know that they're cared for and they're loved and that we're here to support them in, in the ways that we can. So Picking out a new pair of shoes can give a child a lot of confidence. That's where Souls for Souls comes in. She goes for anything that sparkles. It's an international nonprofit headquartered here. It's For Every Kids program has donated shoes to almost 5,000 students across the state this school year. And not just new shoes but new brand name quality shoes, shoes that are like their peers, that help them fit in, they feel like they have confidence. It may sound like a small thing, but clean, comfortable shoes can elevate your mood. Doris Monger knows. She says seeing her children happy inspires her. Yay! If it wasn't for them inspiring me and being in my ear, I wouldn't know where I would be right now. And being in the HERO program has taught me a lot. It taught me not to give up. It taught me to just keep moving forward. See you guys later. A message for all of us in any season of life. Souls for Souls works with school districts across the state, and if you would like to help them, Cromwell Media, our friends, have the 615 Open Golf Tournament coming up on June the 20th to raise money for Souls for Souls, and Fox 17 is among the proud sponsors. Just go to fox17.com and look under Fox Links for more information about that tournament. Now to Operation Crime and Justice, closing arguments are set to take place next week in the hush money criminal trial of former President Trump. The defense resting its case today without Mr. Trump taking the stand. His attorneys only called two witnesses after the prosecution spent over two weeks laying out its case. The jury could have the case as soon as next Wednesday. <laughs> And new information tonight as turbulence is being blamed for the death of one and hurting dozens of other passengers on a Singapore Airlines flight. That flight from London to Singapore made an emergency landing in Bangkok. First responders treated 71 people. Six of those passengers are in critical condition. The airline says the man who died did have a heart condition. 
New tonight, a warning from the Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency. They say we need to be watching out for bears. That's because experts say bears are more active this time of year. We are also seeing more black bears here in our area in the midstate as they migrate slowly from East Tennessee. TWRA says never approach or feed them or any wild animal. The agency warns also to keep an eye out for bears on the roadways as well. And bears, the subject of tonight's Fox 17 viewer poll. We want to know if you've seen a bear in your neck of the woods. So far, 245 people have weighed in. The vast majority say no, we haven't seen them. But there's a 6.1% say yes, we've seen them in our area. You can scan the QR code right now on the right hand side of your screen to let us know about your experience. It'll take you to our X page. Our handle is at Fox Nashville. Hit our code red alert as we track the potential for a few strong thunderstorms going into tomorrow afternoon. There may actually be those some showers and storms tomorrow morning. Uh, most of these should be non severe. Things looking pretty quiet on Broadway this evening here and again overnight we'll look for increasing clouds very mild as well. In fact, overnight lows dropping to maybe 70. Uh, Nashville starting off tomorrow morning with a few showers around again. Most of these uh, non severe. It'll be the afternoon that we're looking at the potential for uh, some damaging wind gusts and or hail. You can see uh, Nashville and Clarksville looking at some showers and uh, showers have yet to reach Cl uh, Crossville by about seven o'clock in the morning hours. We take a look at our storm energy for tomorrow. Again, a lot of this is going to be driven in the afternoon by uh, some of the afternoon sunshine. Uh, this is four o'clock here and you can see anything in green and yellow and orange. You're getting into some moderate to strong energy, so there's enough energy out there for tomorrow. Most of that again will be to the north and west and west of 65 in general. And then as we head towards six o'clock, you can see that energy begins to weaken just a little bit as storms continue to march uh, to the east. So again, uh, potential for a few strong storms will have more chances as we head into the weekend, including the holiday. We'll talk more about that timing it out in your Fox 17 code red forecast. Fox 17 News investigates the family of a special education student that says their daughter was not getting the right treatment at school. Doctors diagnosed Gracie Ring with a food intake disorder, meaning the child relies on a feeding tube. Her parents are now upset after finding out that a school nurse disconnected Gracie's tube several times since January. Wednesday on Fox 17 News at 9, why the district says the child was never at risk and why experts say they don't agree. I'm Kayla Gaskins in Washington. Coming up, how the reparations debate is entering this year's presidential election. And you can't miss them. The question is, when will all these cicadas be gone? Thousands of items. Well, new tonight, the conversation about slave reparations is entering the race for the White House. Fox 17 News' Kayla Gaskins now with more on this growing debate. Climb the wall and escape. Presidential candidate RFK Jr. making a promise to black farmers. If he wins the election, he'll give them $5 billion worth of reparation payments. That $5 billion is not money that is an entitlement. It's money that was a loan that black farmers were entitled to way back then and was stolen from them. Courts already ruled a similar push by the Biden administration as unconstitutional. This comes as state and local governments across the country ramp up their own reparation efforts. I can extend this country to what they did to my people. The Boston People's Reparations Commission demanding the city pay $15 billion to black residents. They also want another 50 million from traditionally white churches in Boston. In California, state lawmakers issuing an official apology last week for California's role in supporting slavery. It is long past for the state to acknowledge its role and responsibility for the atrocities that promoted and facilitated the institution of slavery. Meanwhile, a group in New Jersey is preparing to publish a comprehensive analysis of what reparations should ideally look like. That publication expected on Juneteenth.
Duke economist and reparations advocate William Darty argues for a federal program. However, he estimates it would cost $16 trillion. The U.S. federal government's annual budget is only $6.2 trillion. Garnering support for turning a controversial academic idea into a political reality proving to be an uphill battle. Because reparations were due and never paid for a historical crime does not necessarily mean that the great-great-grandchildren say can demand of the great great grandchildren of the perpetrators that you pay me now. Polling from YouGov shows nearly 70% of black Americans support cash payouts, but overall support for reparations fell by nine percentage points in four years. Now just 30% of Americans are in favor of the idea. In Washington, I'm Kayla Gaskins. Well, you hear all that, it's a rare occurrence that Many of you say should be over by now, or you're ready for it to be. When will we see the end of the cicadas? I'm Christine Frizzow in Washington with new fears of a China-Russia partnership growing stronger by the day. What some experts say the U.S. should be doing to intervene. Continuing coverage now on the growing threats from China and Russia. International experts warn that these countries are becoming more aligned, coming together. Fox 17 News' Christine Frizzau explains what that could mean for the U.S. It's a relationship forged out of common disdain for the West. Now described as one with no limits, Chinese President Xi Jinping and Russian President Vladimir Putin have over the years met more than 40 times in a partnership experts warn is deepening. I think the Ukraine war has brought them together. This is a strategic nightmare to see the two, two of them hug like this. Usually President Xi Jinping is a little more restrained. In response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the U.S. and Western allies levied heavy sanctions on Russia in hopes of hitting its economy. But within months, China stepped in, upping its imports of Russian oil. Last year, Russia surpassed Saudi Arabia to become China's largest oil supplier, as trade hit a record high of $240 billion, with China also said to be providing Russia with supplies needed to build tanks, armored vehicles, and missiles. 70% of the machine tools that uh, Russia is getting from abroad coming from China, 90% of the microelectronics. It's helping Russia perpetuate its aggression against Ukraine, but it's also creating a growing threat to Europe. It's a threat that comes alongside charges of unfair trade practices from China, accused of flooding global markets with low-priced exports. In response, the Biden administration just announced tariffs on solar panels, electric cars, aluminum, and steel. Critics warn it will draw China and Russia even closer together, suggesting the U.S. instead should have had a more aggressive role negotiating an end to the war in Ukraine, which may have slowed China and Russia's deepening ties. China and Russia are outgunning us if they combine their nuclear forces. Uh, this is another example of the cost of driving them together. We want to reduce the number of nuclear weapons in the world, not increase. With new concerns, the alliance may be growing. A Russian delegation reportedly spending this week in North Korea. I'm Christine Frizzau reporting. Continuing coverage tonight on something that's turned into quite a talker these past few weeks, the cicadas. And that noise, unmistakable. Joining us now to talk about the cicadas is Dr. Madula Garish from the Department of Entomology at the University of Tennessee. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you so much for having me. Well, we're going right to the expert here. So the cicadas, they seem to have swarmed in the Midwest and sporadically here in the South. Why is Nashville a favorable area for these insects? So uh, uh, cicadas, like, so as I was, so they go like they uh, are underground for 13 years. So they are technically uh, very dependent on a tree and the whole purpose of them coming up is to complete their life cycles. As we see the males, they start making this noise and uh, they, the females, they try to mate. And finally, uh, the females, she lays eggs and that kind of hatch and goes back to the same tree back. And this particular brood that we see is more uh, southeastern in distribution. So where are we in that life cycle? Because I think a lot of people probably would say they're a bit of a nuisance and they're ready for them to go. <laughs> 
So, yeah, I mean, they emerged uh, somewhere in the early May or towards the end of April. And so this whole process will not be there like for, for, the, for more than a month from now. So probably mid-June or towards the end of June, this is all going to be fine. Okay, so we've got a, a potential end date here in sight. It, it, is it just me or it seems like they're getting louder lately? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that depends on like, as I was mentioning before, they were just they are coming like a swarm and uh, it's it's like depends on how many you got in your yard or uh, where the emergence is happening. Also, uh, when it is a very warm and sunny day, you can hear them well with. Yeah. OK, Dr. Garish <laughs> giving us a timeline here for the cicadas this summer. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you. All right, let's talk about the weather. I don't know if cicadas do uh, better or worse in the rain, but it sounds like more is coming. Yeah, a lot more uh, multiple <laughs> wash rounds. Them out? I know, I mean, right? That'd be nice. Hopefully, I, mean, that I would hope do that something. entomologists didn't hear me say that. <laughs> yeah, I'm about ready to like get some chickens or something in my She's backyard to like, the death you know, of the cicada. go I heard after her. them or something. Yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, hopefully it'll uh, calm them down for a little bit here. But uh, we are looking at uh, the potential for multiple rounds of severe storms. With the one I've talked about for tomorrow uh, is going to be mainly in the afternoon hours and then beyond Wednesday we've got additional chances for showers and storms Thursday and Friday and then into the Memorial weekend. Right now I would say Thursday and Friday chances remain pretty low but not zero for severe storms. A couple are possible and then as we get into the weekend same thing for Saturday and then a slightly higher threat on the way for Sunday. Right now it looks like wind and hail and heavy rain are all the main concern. The tornado threat is low. It's not zero, but as we get into Sunday, the potential for uh, the, um, the or at least the risk for all modes of severe weather uh, will be there. So let's walk you through the next few days. This is overnight and into tomorrow. I mentioned that rain chance for uh, tomorrow, mainly in the afternoon. This is at seven o'clock, so you can see clusters of showers and storms here. We're going to go into Thursday afternoon, and I'm going to stop this here. Few showers in the morning for Thursday morning, but again in the afternoon would be the, t the better timing for anything that may become strong. That chance remains low, but it's not zero. So that's why, again, we want to make sure we're staying on top of things over the next couple of days here. So pockets of heavy rain will be possible, and we continue to see these rounds of showers move through. A warm front then lifting northward on Friday. That may yield a few strong thunderstorms, especially in the morning when we get these lifting mechanisms that are close by. That helps to create a little bit of extra lift for us, a little extra oomph, if you will, for stronger thunderstorms. So that'll be something we need to keep our eye on. And then in the afternoon, Friday, same thing. This pattern just continues all the way through Saturday as a front begins to push its way through the area. So the Saturday, Sunday and Monday forecast here again remain pretty stormy. Temperatures will be in the mid 80s for us. Focused a little more on Sunday here beyond tomorrow. Uh, this will be a chance for some strong thunderstorms and we're already at least looking at ingredients that look possible for severe th thunderstorms. And we're talking about Sunday, it's Tuesday. So whenever we see this outlook here circled in our area, it does grab my attention. So this will be a day that we want to keep an eye on for sure as we head through uh, the next couple of afternoons, especially since we are talking about the holiday weekend. A lot of folks will be out and about. Uh, maybe on the lake, uh, taking the boat out for the first time. So again, just make sure that you are staying aware and you have those ways to stay alert throughout the weekend. Thanks, Katie. Preparing the habitat. The change is underway at the Nashville Zoo. And cash won't do it. We'll tell you what it takes to get treats out of this underwater vending machine. Your total <laughs> Get this just in time for the unofficial start of summer. You can land your very own underwater vending machine. The candy brand Airheads, they have really done it. Coming up with a behind the invention and it gets you to perform. Not for, you don't use your cash, it's uh, fun. And then you get treats. It'll cost you seven grand. I don't know if it's cash or in fun, but it includes a lifetime supply of candy. See a lot of problems that could come along with this though. Hmm. 
kind of fun. We'll try it once. All right, a Fox 17 health alert now. A warning for people who suffer from nightmares. Experts say these bad dreams can actually be a sign of an autoimmune disease. A bigger warning sign, they say, what's known as daymares, which are essentially mild walking hallucinations. Doctors say if you're having any of these issues, you need to talk to your family physician. Still to come, some exciting changes at the Nashville Zoo. What these trees mean for animal lovers. Get up to 20 boy locations. New tonight, big changes underway at the Nashville Zoo in the form of big trees. Now, this is really something. The zoo is taking 40 to 60 foot tall trees from other parts of the zoo and replanting them. I'm sure they had a huge crane. Look at that monster. These will be part of what the zoo is calling the leopard forest. Despite the name, though, leopards will not be the uh, only animals calling this forest home. There's going to be five different types of animals that are in leopard forest. A more leopards. Um, and then we got a couple of primate species. We have uh, Debrazis monkeys and Colobus monkeys. One of those will go into this exhibit that you see behind me. Then we also have Clipspringer, which is like a small uh, gazelle that lives on the rocks. Hey, just like the jungle, right? This exhibit will open sometime in the fall. Keep you posted. This is Fox 17 News at 10, your code red station. Fox 17 News at 10 continues our code red weather alert for the possibility of strong storms tomorrow. That's right. You know, it does start tomorrow, but it will not end there. And Fox 17 code red chief meteorologist Katie Morgan here with the immediate threat and how long the threats will continue. Yeah, tomorrow it looks to be afternoon 4 p.m. to maybe 9, 10 p.m. Uh, so the good news is we're not talking about a overnight event for tomorrow. Beyond that, we'll continue to see chances for showers and storms, couple strong to severe possible. And unfortunately, it looks like our stormy pattern will continue through the holiday weekend. This is the outlook for tomorrow, and you can see we're on the edge of the higher threat. So higher threat is more into Arkansas and portions of the, the boot heel. West Tennessee, a higher threat for us as well. We're kind of clipped by that level two threat in uh, Henry and Stewart County, Trigg and Christian and Todd counties, as well as Logan counties. Nashville level one out of five threat. Doesn't mean a zero threat though. So a couple of these storms could produce localized damaging wind gusts, maybe some hail and localized flooding as well. Again, timing right now looks to be in the afternoon, although we will see showers and storms tomorrow morning. These, though, are mainly non-severe for the morning hours. Maybe noisy, but again, that better threat for stronger storms will be in the afternoon. Uh, things on Broadway pretty quiet for tonight. We've been watching this line to our west. This will be what we see for tomorrow morning, this sort of broken line of showers and a few storms as well. Uh, but again, after afternoon will be the time frame we're looking for some stronger activity. Temperatures right around 70 here in Nashville, upper 60s elsewhere for the overnight. We'll walk you through future track for this uh, storm threat for tomorrow and talk more about the potential for other thunderstorm chances later in the week. That's all coming up. It's absolutely frustrating. Well, Metro Councilwoman Sandra Sepulveda is leading the charge to better protect Nashville construction workers. That's right. She is sponsoring a measure calling for the creation of a new Metro office to investigate complaints after two local construction workers are killed on the job. Fox 17 News' Caitlin Miller now live downtown at Metro Courthouse, where Council met tonight with more on this effort. Metro Council member Sepulveda says the fight to protect these workers has been going on for years because she says that previous legislation that she had was overruled by the state. Now Sepulveda says that the tragic deaths of 20 year old Dennis Giovanni Bache and 16 year old Gustavo Ramirez underscore the urgency of this new ordinance proposed called the Build It Right Bill. Sepulveda says this bill will enhance worker protection and it will create a board that will have the authority to evaluate construction contracts and investigate complaints. Alonzo Alvarez lost his cousin Dennis to a construction incident and he was joined by an interpreter today. He sees how dangerous it is to work out here and how many injuries occur here and that companies should really be uh, responsible for their workers, for their injuries. 
Sepulveda emphasizes enough is enough, and she says with all the cranes and construction projects going on in Nashville, this needs to happen very soon to protect our workers. Reporting live from downtown, I'm Caitlin Miller, Fox 17 News, your Code Red Station. I have seen many different things, many operators be assaulted physically, verbally, spat on. In Operation Crime and Justice, transit advocates want a safer community after police say a WeGo bus driver was stabbed by a passenger this week. This all comes less than a week after a convicted felon was accused of shooting a teenager on the steps of a WeGo building downtown. Nashville native Darius Knight, who rides the bus and has family who works for WeGo, says transportation leaders need to take this seriously. He says years of complaints have fallen on deaf ears. Many of the customers that use the services uh, have disabilities. They have many different backgrounds, and this is a need for them. So we need our transit services to be safe and reliable. But unfortunately, over the last few years, that's not what's been happening. WeGo says the agency is currently working with a security consultant firm. The two will look at a variety of safety measures, including their current security staffing models, as well as recommendations for placement of emergency messaging systems and panic alarms. New tonight, Metro Council members are standing with members of the Metro School Board and the district's decision not to allow teachers or staff to carry guns on campus. Fox 17 News Peyton News now with more on both sides of this issue. This comes after Governor Bill Lee signed a bill into law giving districts the OK to allow teachers and staff to carry if they choose. Gloria Mays used to be a teacher. Now she works for Defense Systems, which focuses on active shooter training. Mays believes this leaves Metro schools in a vulnerable position. It's really unfortunate. Um, you know, to me, it, it seems seems a little irresponsible. Mays says the first thing that comes to mind is the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School shooting in Parkland, Florida. She says an SRO was present that day. And he made it to the exterior of the building within a minute and 50 seconds of the attack starting and chose not to go inside. But two teachers did choose to go inside, two unarmed teachers. And, you know, they unfortunately both died that day. Mays wonders if those two teachers were armed, would that have led to a different ending? Metro Council member Antoinette Lee is the lead sponsor on the resolution, backing MNPS's decision, saying it's bad policy. We listened to our citizens and we listened to our parents and we listened to our staff members. This law says that uh, uh, someone will have a gun. Of course, they'll have to go through training, but we won't even know who it is. And so parents are, are up in air about how it's being done. Under the state law, the director of schools and police will know who is carrying on campus, and each staff member must finish 40 hours of training and a mental evaluation. Mays says the law is better than nothing. To just write it off from the start if you're not even going to consider it is... Like I said, I mean, I think that's why it's dangerous because it's it's leaving such an open vulnerability at these schools. Councilwoman Lee says it's a sad time of the world we live in, but this law is wrong for Nashville. I don't want us to use this as a Band-Aid and think this is over because this is not. This is not going to solve the problem. The problem needs to be looking someplace else. MNPS says it has a strong relationship with Metro Police and it's safest for active duty officers to carry on campus. And that's how it's always been and they have no intention of changing that. Reporting at Metro Courthouse, Peyton Muse, Fox 17 News, your Code Red Station. Well, continuing coverage tonight as the father of the Murfreesboro boy who died after being swept into a storm drain shares that his son's donated organs have saved four lives. The Rutherford County community rallied around 10-year-old Asher Sullivan in hopes of his recovery. He was playing outside during the severe storms earlier this month when the accident happened. Devastating weather snapping wind turbines in two. The damage done this afternoon as tornadoes tore across the Great Plains. The Met 
Some wicked weather today as powerful tornadoes roll through the parts of uh, southwest Iowa. Take a look. This is video of a storm chaser in Adams County, Iowa. Where you can see the tornado right there in the middle. This is again this afternoon. The storm broke at least three of those 250 tall wind turbines. The blades fell to the ground, sparking the fires you see there. Heavy storms accompanied these to tornadoes. The National Weather Service has confirmed two tornadoes so far. In national news, Senator Bob Menendez's bribery trial is taking a week long break. The presiding judge says jurors got trapped for several minutes in an elevator today due to power issues, and the facility is also dealing with flood damage. Proceedings are now paused as prosecutors build their case against the senator. Among witnesses was a former State Department worker who prosecutors say was there at the time Menendez used his power for favors. I'm Jeff Harrison, Washington. Don't hit pay before double checking your total. We explain the hidden fees that could be added to your bill coming up. And coming up, we'll talk more about our storm threat going into tomorrow and threats beyond Wednesday. Liberty Mutual 17. Nestle, the company that makes DiGiorno Pizza, Stouffer's, and Lean Cuisine Meals, has developed a new line of packaged foods for people on weight loss drugs, Wegovi or Ozempic. The new brand is called Vital Pursuit. Nestle says the products contain more protein, iron, and calcium to help people on the medications with the right nutrition, protein, good fiber, and the right minerals. The products are set to debut in October for under $5 per item. A breakfast deal from Wendy's. Starting Monday, the burger chain will offer a $3 breakfast combo meal, including seasoned potatoes and a choice of either a bacon, egg and cheese English muffin or a sausage, egg and cheese English muffin. And the first ever cheese in diner is now open. Inspired by the nostalgic charm of American diners, the entire menu is infused with the iconic Cheese It crackers, including the extra cheeseburger and the deluxe Cheese It milkshake. Want to play some tunes while you're there? No coins needed for the jukebox. Just drop in a Cheese It cracker. But hurry up. This diner is only open until Sunday in Woodstock, New York. Time for a road trip. That's business. C.J. Papa, Fox News. Well, earlier in our newscast, we told you about our X poll up and running right now, asking the question, uh, the TWRA issuing a warning about more bear activity. The question tonight, have you seen a bear in your neck of the woods? 257 votes have come in. Most people say no. 93% of respondents, no. 7% say yes. Each night, look for a new poll on our X page that you can participate in. Thanks for voting. Covering the economy tonight, shoppers beware. The next time you're out, you may want to double check the total price before swiping your card. Fox 17 News' Jeff Harris reveals the hidden fees that you could absolutely miss if you don't know what you're looking for. They are becoming a lot more common in a lot more places. Restaurants, clothing stores, even online buying concert tickets. Hidden fees are being tacked onto your bill, and the worst part is you might not even see it coming. It's like a bait and switch. They get you in the door, and then they figure, well, you're already here. You're not going to leave. Bruce Winder is a retail analyst who regularly tracks hidden fees. He tells us companies in many different industries are now using a strategy called decoupling to try and hit lower price points. Instead of adding all the costs of doing business into one lump sum and then adding your profit onto it and charging a retail price, um, what, what these uh, companies are trying to do is sort of take it piece by piece. So to consumers, the price looks low, but once those convenience fees, design fees, or even service fees get added, that price shoots up. The, the, the restaurant may feel clever. You know, the, the owner, the proprietor may feel clever, but they're not clever. They're really just hurting themselves by doing this. Now, to avoid paying those hidden fees, Denise Shaw, a marketing professor at Georgia State, says make sure you take a good look at the price breakdown before hitting pay and don't let the lowest price fool you. Go all the way, you know, until the final uh, purchase button, you know, shows up uh, to really find out what indeed is going to be the price that they would be paying. 
Now those hidden fees are really nothing new. The White House estimates that Americans spend more than $65 billion on fees each and every year. I'm Jeff Harris reporting from Washington. In our Code Red Alert, tracking the potential for strong storms going into Wednesday. Now, main threat is going to be west of us out into Arkansas and the Boot Hill, Missouri. But we're kind of on that the tail end of it, and it is possible to see a couple strong storms for the afternoon, especially west of I-65. We'll zoom in, and you can see Nashville's included in that level one threat. It does get a little higher as we head towards Clarksville, Hopkinsville, and Paris. So generally, I expect the line to weaken as it moves through, but it may take a little time to do so and may end up bringing a few of those strong thunderstorms again, mainly west of 65. So a medium threat for tomorrow, generally a low threat for Thursday, Friday and Saturday. I do think we'll have the potential for a few strong thunderstorms each day. The threat's just a little lower for Thursday, Friday and Saturday. Then we get into Sunday and Monday and it's looking like the potential for more severe weather is uh, possible for us. And we're already looking at Sunday and Monday. And it's only Tuesday, so uh, it's going to be a busy week for sure. Temperatures here in the 80s for tomorrow. We will see some showers in the morning hours, but the better threat for strong thunderstorms will come later in the day. So we do have a line coming in. This will be from the a line that brought a ton of severe weather to parts of Missouri and Iowa this afternoon, uh, but we will not see severe storms for the morning. May Maybe noisy and producing some heavy rain, but likely looking at the better threat to be in the afternoon for us here. Mostly cloudy skies late morning. We get into the later part of the day and you can see uh, showers setting up to our uh, north and then eventually you can see that line starting to spill in from the northwest. That would be the timing between about four and I'd say seven o'clock where we have the highest threat for severe weather. Then as we get towards eight, nine, ten o'clock, we have a lower threat for severe weather. And then as we head into eight to midnight, Almost no chance for severe weather, but we'll still see showers and storms around uh, as we uh, pass through Murfreesboro to Cookville and Crossville. Some locally uh, heavy rain again possible as well. Thursday morning, more showers and storms coming in. These mainly non severe, but again may offer some heavy rain and we continue to see these rounds of thunderstorms uh, one round after another after another. Heavy rain may lead to localized flooding. The more we see these storms around again over the course of the next several days. This is 10 a.m. And then notice as we get into the afternoon, we'll get a little more energy from the afternoon sunshine. It may pop up a few strong thunderstorms for us that should last into the early evening. This is 4 p.m. And then notice as we head towards 7 and eventually 10, 11 p.m., a few more pockets of rain possible for us. Into Friday morning, we will start the morning off with a few showers and we'll once again uh, look for the potential for a few strong thunderstorms here. As we go through Sunday into Monday, that'll be the next area that we're watching. I do think there is a potential even for Friday, but for now I'm focused on Wednesday and I'm focused on Sunday, um, but we will keep an eye on again Thursday, Friday and Saturday. <laughs> Again, very busy uh, for Sunday, though. This will be the next bigger chance for severe weather that we are watching. And I do think that all modes of severe weather could could be possible for us here uh, if uh, the signals continue to show what they are showing a couple days down the road. So that is something that we will be watching closely and keep in mind it is going to be the holiday weekend too. a lot of folks. I'm sure are going to be out and about with plans, so make sure you have those ways to stay alert. Temperatures will stay in the mid 80s for the next several days. We can see a very busy, very stormy pattern ahead. Weather window presented by the National Weather Desk. Severe storms in Nebraska yesterday brought plenty of lightning as well as hail. The threat for severe weather today stretches from Texas to the Great Lakes. After some storms this morning near Kalamazoo, this rainbow graced the skies. And several security cameras caught this fireball or very bright meteor streaking across the Montana sky last night. Listen to Off the Radar, new episodes every Tuesday. Find it wherever you get your podcasts. Just ahead, back to work for the Titans, our first look at the team's newest offensive weapons. Did they take? Today marking day two of the Titans voluntary organized team activities, OTAs. And for the first time this offseason, we got to see the team's new wide receiver core in action. Fox 17 Sports Director Jill Delnick has more on the new look wide receiver room.
Titans head coach Brian Callahan making a flurry of moves this offseason to help improve the roster. And one of those areas was the Titans wide receiver room. Titans signing both Tyler Boyd and Kelvin Ridley this offseason, adding two more veterans on top of the presence of DeAndre Hopkins. Now, Hopkins, Boyd, and also Ridley were all at OTAs this week, giving quarterback Will Levis plenty of options to throw to, which coach Callahan says is a really great problem to have. It should afford a lot of opportunities, um, a lot of Less, a lot less double coverage, a lot less cloud. Um, all, all these guys all want the ball, and it's a great problem to have. Man, I mean, I can learn from them guys, and, and they can learn from me. You know, and just having that trio of us, you know, is going to just make this whole offense even more deadly. He's one of the best wide receiver groups I've had a chance to play with on paper. So, uh, obviously, you know, I can come up here and say a bunch, but we haven't played a game yet. So, uh, you know, we'll see how, how it goes once we uh, once we hit the field. Boyd is already familiar with the Titans offense because of his time with Coach Callahan when he was the OC for the Bengals. Boyd says that it's certainly an advantage when it comes to learning the playbook, and it also will be an advantage when he quickly builds chemistry with quarterback Will Levis. I think it, it allows him to play more freely and more comfortable because he know that I know the offense. He know that I will be uh, in positions of the field where he expect me to be. It's been a quick turnaround this week for Tyler Boyd. He first First flew into Nashville on Monday and then quickly got right to work on the practice field with the rest of the team on Tuesday. It's the first time in his eight year NFL career that he's wearing a jersey other than the Cincinnati Bengals. He says being a veteran that transition is a little more smoother and it also helps that he's played for head coach Brian Callahan before. Reporting from the Titans practice facility, Jill Johnlick, Fox 17 Sports, your Code Red Station. To hockey now, Preds making a shocking move to start the offseason, trading away defenseman Ryan McDonough down to the Tampa Bay Lightning. In exchange, the Preds get fourth and seventh round picks in this year's NHL draft and for McDonough, a second round pick in 2025. General Manager Barry Trott says McDonough asked to try to get him back to Tampa. He asked if I would, uh, you know, explore that a little bit. If, and so out of, out of respect and, and, uh, and type of person that Ryan is, uh, talked to Julian and, and we made, a, I think, a fair deal. The McDonough trade will give the Preds nearly $7 million in cap space over the next two seasons. All right, I have an exact replica of this race car you're seeing here. I'm Liz Bonus. We're going to explain why it's significant, why people are excited about it, and more importantly, how you can protect yourself if you're headed to any big events such as the Indy 500 this year. From smart watches to fitness trackers, many devices are busy collecting our sensitive health data. Which information scientists say could be targeted for cyber attacks? We've got the details Wednesday morning on Fox 17 News this morning. In your health news, Memorial Day weekend kicks off a lot of summer events, including the Indy 500. That's right, the big one. Fox 17 medical reporter Liz Bonus tonight to show us some ways that fans can stay safe in the stands. Hey everybody, this is a race car. I have a little replica of it here. We got to check it out in one of the only home museums I've ever seen for the Indy 500. But it does remind us we're heading into the summer event season and event medicine specialists say safety for all of us needs to be top of mind. We call it the Rust Racing Museum. Uh, we've been Indy 500 fans for our whole lifetime. For 30 years, Claude Rost and his brother Steve have been collecting memories from not just the Indianapolis 500. If you go around here, you have signed stuff for Mario Andretti, for instance. There's Formula One back there. There's one case that has NASCAR. They have helmets from some of the best drivers, uniforms and jackets of all sizes, and the car, they let me climb in, it's... Buddy Lazier's uh, race car from 1994 uh, it did not qualify for the race, but it was the Budweiser car the year before. By the time Buddy Lazier did win the race two years later... He won the race with a broken back. The Indy track has a state-of-the-art hospital for any injured racers. The Rost brothers remember them all. James Hinchcliffe was in a terrible wreck and a piece of his car went through his leg and he was bleeding out. It's probably the best setup for for, for saving injured drivers. Joseph Newgarden grabbing the lead. But 
what you may not realize is that fans are at risk for injuries too at just about any event. Dave Stickle knows that. He's the manager of event medicine for Ohio's Tri Health. We take care of the spectators, the athletes at major sporting events. And at those events, his team sees an awful lot of fan injuries that could be prevented. Biggest thing really, uh, especially during the summer months, is dehydration. Stickle says from overuse of alcohol to summer sun, overheating is common. So are broken bones from trips and falls, along with heart events. You just never know. It could happen at any event. He says your best bet is to know where the AEDs are at any event center and to stay hydrated. And as Claude and Steve know from so many races, you got to pace yourself. This collection obviously has been decades in the making, complete with all these little replicas. They make us feel part of that passion when you talk to those guys, don't they? With your health news, I'm Liz Bonus reporting. Are you bumpy right ahead of us? Yeah, it's looking like a couple couple days that we're going to be dealing with the strongest severe thunderstorms. We'll focus on tomorrow first. Uh, best threat is going to be along in west is 65 in the afternoon hours. Uh, so we'll likely be tracking this uh, for part of the 530. And uh, we'll continue to see showers and storms into the weekend and into the holiday uh, weekend, I should say. Uh, Sunday right now looking like the better day for severe storms.